Good evening. Welcome to Registration 1R2, our pre-registration online information session. Michael Mason and Lynn Maria Hamill of the Office of Undergraduate Studies will be reviewing information to help you develop your course schedule and prepare for registration later this week. I am Nancy Giulio from the Office of Undergraduate Studies and will be taking your questions. Please send your questions to summerreghelp at case.edu and we will answer your questions live on air. If we don't get to your question on air, we will follow up with you shortly. And now to your hosts, Dean Mason and Dean Hamill. Good evening and welcome to our second online information session, Registration 102. Uh, I am Assistant Dean for First Year Students, Michael Mason. Along with me is uh, Senior Associate Dean Lynn Marie Hamill. We're both from the Office of Undergraduate Studies. And we'd like to say welcome once again to those of you who are tuning into us for the first time. And welcome back to those of you who've been with us uh, viewing other online information sessions. We're definitely glad to be here, glad to be uh, having the opportunity to talk with you this evening as we prepare for something that's truly exciting, which is uh, your first venture into uh, registering for your first semester uh, at college, which is, is a very happy and exciting time. We're glad to be uh, a part of that with you. It just means that you're you know, one step closer to joining us here on campus in the fall. So this is great, glad you're here. Um, so we've got a lot to cover tonight. We've got a lot of information that we wanna share with you leading up to registration. Um, we're definitely looking to take a lot of your questions, so feel free to go ahead and start sending them in. I'm going to start off by just getting right into it and going over some important dates uh, that are upcoming. So as you're all probably aware at this point, uh, registration coming up on Thursday morning, so 9 o'clock Eastern Time, we will open uh, registration for you. We'll close that up at 11.59 p.m. on July the 17th. Uh, once that closes, the 18th through the 27th, um, Myself, along with other deans in the Office of Undergraduate Studies, will be reviewing student schedules. Um, after the schedule reviews are complete, um, and actually before we get to the completion there, um, we will be having another online information session on the 19th called What's Next, where uh, Dean Hamill and I will be back once again to give you some more information about um, what's gonna happen post-registration leading up to orientation. Um, but like I said, 18th through the 27th, we'll review schedules. Um, in early August, after the schedules have all been reviewed, you'll be contacted uh, and asked to select uh, SAGE's first seminar. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then following through uh, mid-August into early August, we have uh, new student orientation, including your opportunities to meet with your SAGE's instructor, uh, who is also your first year advisor. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dean Hamill, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit more about some of the considerations that you wanna keep in mind as you're developing your schedule for the first semester. Thanks, Michael. I'm glad to be here with everybody. It's been a while since we were here um, with you. It's been about a month. So we do wanna go quickly through some information about um, what to, what to look for as you're putting together a schedule. A lot of people have things in their shopping carts, but we know a lot of people still um, are not quite sure what to take. So again, we just wanna review some information with you tonight. First of all, we want you to think about the differences between high school and college as you're, as you're thinking about um, what classes that you want to take. In high school, you probably only had one section of a course offered or very limited electives offered. In, K and in college, you're gonna have multiple options, multiple subjects, and you're really gonna be responsible for putting together all of those um, different courses. And I know people are having problems narrowing down what courses they are because there are so many different options. I guess the best thing we can tell you at this point is to look through the schedule of classes and see what interests you. See what, see what you're interested in, classes that you may have not taken before, things that look fun to you, and just choose ones that either are recommended for your major or that are interesting to you and go from there. You're gonna have four years here. You'll be able to take a lot of classes over the next four years. So just you know, look at some and kind of go with that, knowing that you'll be able to take a lot more classes um, in the future. The other thing that you need to kind of think of is um, the number of hours that you're gonna be spending in class. In high school, you probably spend about six hours a day, at least 30 hours a week, if not more in high school, in classes. It, at school, in college, you may only spend 15 to 20 hours a week in class, and people are saying, well, I need to be taking more courses. There's a really a difference between what you need to do in high school classes and in college classes. You may only have to spend zero to you know, two or three hours a week studying in high school, 
But in college, for every, um, you need to spend at least two to three hours outside of class for every hour that you spend in class. So that turns out to be a lot of, a lot of hours in a week. Because you're going to have to do outside reading, you may have review sessions, um, you need to be completing assignments. So there's a lot more that you need to do that you might not have um, had to do when you're in high school. So when you're thinking of those things, you need to start thinking about classes being between the number of credit hours, between 14 and 17 hours, um, and not, you know, I need to take 19 or 20 hours because that's going to be a lot more work um, than you're used to. And the other thing you need to think about is um, how are you going to spend your free time? When in high school, you probably had very structured time for lunches and, and free periods and so forth. The responsibility on you here at college is really on you as to kind of how you're going to use all that time and manage all that extra time. You know, it'd be easy to say, okay, I want to go and play, you know, I want to take a nap, or I'm going to go and play, you know, murals, or I'm going to do all these other things, or I want to work. But you have to kind of balance all those things um, because it, <coughs> it's going to be a lot more um, higher ex expectations in your class, a lot more outside learning that you're going to need to do. But that being said, we do want you to have a balanced lifestyle. You know, we do want you to you know, be able to eat and sleep and exercise and hang out with friends once in a while, but it does need to be balanced against the, um, the higher expectations that are going to be on you um, in your academic coursework. So again, just those are some of the things you need to kind of consider as you're looking at classes, thinking of you know, three to four classes that you want to register for now, knowing that we'll add a Sage's First Seminar later, and keeping your class limit or the credit hours the first semester between 14 to 17 hours, knowing that some people may go up to 19 depending on what their majors are. So again, just some things to kind of consider as you're putting your classes together. Now we'll go back to Michael, talk about some um, credit issues that we've been getting a lot of information, questions about. Yes, yeah, so we've been getting a lot of questions about credit. So AP credit, IB credit, transfer credit. We know that um, well, most of you probably saw the registration update email that came out last Friday that talked about us having posted all the AP credit that and IB credit that we've received up to this point. So if you haven't had the chance to do this already, what we want to do is kind of direct your attention over to SIS, the Student Information System. Um, we'd like for you to go on to SIS and actually take a look at your course history. So when you log on to the Student Center, uh, one of the first screens you're going to see when you log in is going to be kind of the Student Center homepage. Um, down towards the, the upper left, I guess you could say, of, of the screen, you're going to see um, a drop down menu. And um, once you click on that menu, one of the options that's going to be there is going to be course history. And so if you click on course history, what you're going to see is going to be uh, a list here of all the different uh, courses for which you've earned credit to this point. And again, it'll list the courses by you know, course number, course description, and then in the grade column there, it'll give you an idea of where that credit came from. So if it was from AP credit, it'll be listed there as AP. Um, if it was IB credit, it'll be listed as IB. Uh, if it was transfer credit, it'll be listed as TR. But this is where you can find out whether or not uh, the credit that you believe you should be or you should have earned um, is actually listed in SIS and whether or not we've actually received that credit for you. So we've been getting a lot of questions about um, what if I, I'm missing credit or I don't see the credit on the SIS uh, drop-down box. So a few things that we need you to do if, you're, uh, if you think you're missing credit. First, you should check the score equivalency information, the FYI guide, if you know what your score is, to see if you've met the criteria to actually get credit um, for a course here. Second, you need to see if we actually, if you had your, cor your score sent to CASE. When we had, uh, when you first took the courses, if you took AP classes, for example, in um, your sophomore year, you might not have realized that you were coming to CASE at that point and didn't request that your scores be sent here. So check and make sure that your scores have been sent to CWRU. Um, if you do have a score report from a pr um, from pr uh, previous year, you can send them to us. You can fax them to us, and the number is listed at 216-368-4718, or you can email them to us, scan and email it to us um, at summerregehelp at case.edu, and we can post the scores there. So those are the first few things that you should do if you think you're missing AP or IB um, scores. If you're missing or you, you believe you're missing transfer or college credit uh, information, you should um, look at your checklist and review the information there because we've been updating um, the checklist as to whether we have your enrollment verification forms and your transcripts. So look there and see if you're still missing something. If you are, make sure you get that information sent to us as well. Um, and just to remind everybody that even though um, you know, the, the published deadline has been passed for when you should send us this information, we're still going to be able to post um, AP scores or IB scores and transfer credit scores if we get them um, at this date. So that's kind of what you need to do if you're looking for any missing credit. And if you have any other questions about credit, please feel free to call us at 368-2928 um, or email us at summerregehelp at case.edu to see if you can find where that credit is. 
The next thing that we've gotten a lot of questions about um, as far as AP credit goes is whether to, um, whether to use the credit or not use the credit. Um, and here we just have some kind of four general principles that we want you to think about as you're making this decision. First of all, our general recommendation is to accept the credit and move on. You know, you've proven yourself that you've been able to do college level work. You, you received you know, a high grade on the, on the AP exam. So you just need to, you know, you've learned, mastered that material. It's time to move on to something that, you know, beyond the survey courses, things that may be of more interest to you, things that may be more directly to your major and, and, and kind of look at you know look to see if the classes are interesting to you and, and the next ones in the sequence and go on and take those classes. The other thing you can think about is kind of it's not moving on is if you did take a class a long time ago for example if you took for example your chemistry AP exam in your sophomore year and it's been a few years since you've taken chemistry and you don't want to jump into organic chemistry you can look to say okay I don't need to do my whole first year so maybe I'll give up one semester of chemistry and um, you know, and take Chem 106 this semester, so then you'll be able to take organic chemistry next semester. And that can be whether it's in um, you know, a, a language class, and, and a math class, and a chemistry class. So think about how long ago you took these classes, um, and then kind of make some decisions there. And the other thing we need you to remember is that there's an add drop period. So even if you get into, you know, we'd like you to move on, if you get into a class and you have no idea what they're talking about or you don't really remember covering any of these concepts, talk to the instructor, look at the syllabus, and then if you still don't feel comfortable in that class, you can go back to that other class. So for example, if you got a five um, on, your, on your calculus uh, um, exam and you're able to go into calculus three and you get there and it just, it's not what you expected, um, you can go back and you can give up the, the credit for calculus two and go back. So those are just some of the things that we want you to consider when you're thinking about whether to use your AP credit or not use your AP credit. So moving on from credit, there's a few things that we want you to start, look, or start to look at uh, registering for classes. And a few things that you should be asking yourself is, as you know, the day draws close um, for when you can register, is it, did I review the FYI guide? Have I looked at you know, how to put things in my shopping cart, uh, the registration instructions so you know how to enroll when the time actually comes on Thursday morning? Have I reviewed the schedule development recommendations for each of the majors that, um, that were in the FYI guide? Have I done all the, you know, the information or the diagnostic tests on the, on the checklist? Um, did I make sure that there are no time conflicts with the courses that you choose? You remember, you can't be in two classes or two, you know, two places at one time. So you can't be in a course that conflicts with another course. Um, and um, y you know, this, it's not a good idea. You can't be in two places at once. And did you check to see that you met all the course prerequisites? So you know, if you're trying to get into you know, the second level Spanish, then you, should make, you have to make sure that you have the entry level Spanish. So make sure you've checked your prerequisites um, as well before you start to register. And make sure that you have some alternates in your shopping cart in case there are smaller recitation sections or lab sections that are closed when you go to register, that you want to make sure that you have some other course options that you know, if you do have to take a certain lab space, that there's another course option that you have there um, that you can get register for at that particular time. So you shouldn't have problems registering if you do go through this little checklist um, before um, Thursday morning starts. So as Dean <coughs> Hamill said, the checklist has hopefully at this point become very familiar to you, something that uh, you've been using quite a bit. And so at this point, we hope that you know, you've completed all the items related to the diagnostics and filled out information for advisors, um, all that kind of stuff. I've uh, actually brought to, with me today a little screenshot of the checklist that I'd like to show you that includes um, just some of the academic advising and, and diagnostic information that you're probably really familiar with. But what I really wanted to highlight here was the uh, first year registration item on the checklist, which is still, at this point in time, going to be something that you'll be continuing to use frequently leading up through registration. And so you can see here, this is where you, you know, have gone already to look at the FYI guide and used all the information in the FYI guide to help you develop your schedule. Um, this is also where you've uh, been able to get access to the student information system, or SIS, and fill your shopping cart. Uh, and also where you've been able to, you know, view our old uh, on online information sessions as well to get more information. Um, but as long as you've placed courses into your shopping cart and, you know, prepared yourself uh, as far as, you know, selecting courses and making sure the times um, fit together and all that kind of stuff, uh, you should be pretty much good to go come when registration opens. So when you log into SIS, you should you know, go ahead and log in and, and just enroll yourself in courses. The step-by-step -step instructions are in the FYI guide. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight here was that if, if you do run into a situation where um, a course that you're trying to enroll in uh, requires instructor consent, 
Um, there's an item in the checklist in the first year registration section that will actually allow you to go on and submit that information to us so that we can uh, look into getting consent for you. Um, the same goes for any closed courses. So if you go to log in uh, and on uh, Thursday morning or whenever you go to register and you want to go enroll in a class and uh, for one reason or another the course is closed, uh, all you need to do is go back onto the checklist, uh, open up that item in the first year registration section, and enter the course information, and we'll review that request for you and get back to you as soon as we can with more information about the status for that course. So you can see uh, on this next screenshot that I have here for you that um, this is what the form would look like. It's called a scheduled change request. Again, you just you know go onto the checklist, open up the item, give us your information, let us know which course you're trying to get into, and once registration closes, during the uh, schedule review period, July 18th through the 27th, um, is when we'll go back and look at these requests and, and do the very, very best that we can to accommodate all of your requests. Uh, one thing I would mention is that you know if, if you're in a situation where you need a course for your major, uh, we are very, very successful at, at getting students into the courses that they need for the most part. Um, if you run into a situation where there's a course that you want to take as an elective or just a general education course and there's another course that you'd be just as happy with taking and, and that one happens to be open, you may want to go ahead and, and look at taking that course instead knowing that you can always go back in a future semester and, and take that elective course or take that general education course. But either way, if you, if you find yourself in a situation where a course you want to get into is, is closed or full, just let us know and we'll definitely look into that for you. So the other thing I wanted to mention real quickly was that, you know, as long as you've you know done the preparation work, again, you've, you've gone through and, and looked through the information in the FYI guide, uh, you've used the shopping cart as your tool for course planning, um, you've looked at all the different information about the courses like the dates and times and the prerequisites, you should be pretty much good to go. And once you get on SIS and, and complete the registration, it, it should go uh, pretty smoothly for you. Um, there may be a situation given various potential circumstances where you may see one of a couple different error messages uh, and SIS, and on SIS when you go to register, so I just wanted to bring those up to you just to kind of preview those for you. So um, one, of the, one of the first error messages is that you might see is closed. Uh, so if you go to enroll in a course and it says that it's closed, again, as I mentioned already, just go on to the checklist, uh, open up the first year registration item, uh, fill out the form, and we will take care of it from there. Um, if there is a time conflict, uh, Dean Hamill already mentioned, you know, when you're looking at courses, if there's two courses offered at the same time, uh, you will need to choose between those two courses. You can only be in one place at a time. Uh, you've got exams, quizzes, assignments, things that you need to take care of. And we all know that being in class is one of the most important keys to success uh, in any academic endeavor, so we can only have you in one place at a time, and therefore, if there's a time conflict, you're going to have to choose between one of those two courses. Um, <clears throat> some of the other potential error messages that you may get, uh, prerequisites not met. Again, this may come up if uh, you're attempting to roll, let's say, in a Calc 2, um, and uh, you need Calc 1 as a prereq to get into that course, and for some reason there was an issue with getting us your AP, IB, or transfer credit. Um, this, may came, this may come up. If this happens, just send an email to us, uh, summeredgehelp at case.edu, <clears throat> and we'll definitely be able to help you out with that. Um, otherwise, if you don't have the prerequisites, um, in most cases, you wouldn't be able to take the course. But again, and if you have questions about that, just let us know. And finally, uh, consent required. We already reviewed this, but just to remind you, if, if you're trying to add a course and it says that you need instructor consent, Again, just go onto the checklist, uh, open up the schedule change request form, and fill out that form. And, and like I said, we will investigate that for you, and we will uh, get back to you as soon as we have more information about the status of that request. So. Great. Now, the last thing um, that you need to do is your SAGE's first seminar. As we've talked um, earlier, you're going to be registering for all of your classes except your first seminar. And what will happen is that after we review all of your schedules, we'll be notifying the SAGE's office that your schedule is set. And then you'll be receiving an email from them um, listing out um, a certain number of um, seminars that actually fit your schedule. And you'll be asked, you'll be directed to um, a website 
that we look something like what we have um, up on the screen here. Um, and you'll ask to choose uh, uh, four or so um, seminars that you'd be interested in taking. And the SAGE's office will actually place you in those seminars. And then you'll be notified probably mid-August as to what your, you know, what your seminar placement will be. And again, it'll be ones that you, know, you said that you'd be interested in taking. Um, you'll be notified in August. And once that happens, um, you'll then know what classes you're in, your schedule will be finalized, and you'll also know who your first year advisor is because as Michael had mentioned earlier, your first seminar instructor will be your, your um, academic advisor for your um, first uh, at least your first semester, potentially for your first year. There's a few things that we ask that you don't do in relation to the first seminar. And please don't put Sage's first seminars in your shopping cart because you're not able to enroll for them um, directly. So don't attempt to register for them because you'll get error messages. Um, and I think that just, you know, people will get frustrated if they see the error messages, but you're not able to register for your, your first seminar classes on your own. And don't request permission for a first seminar because that will go to an instructor. And again, we will be placing all of you into, into a seminar class. So we ask that you not do that. So I think we just want to wrap things up at this point. Again, we want to go just through some general information and hopefully we've got some questions out there that we can answer for you to help you get registered. Great, thanks. That was really good information. Uh, we do have a number of questions coming in, so let's dive right in. So the first question came in and uh, we have a student who wants to know, they have AP credit for English. But they're going to, of course, take a first seminar, Sage's first seminar. Does that mean that they're going to lose that AP credit for English? Or can that AP credit for their English course meet some type of graduation requirement? That's a very good question because I know a lot of students have, you know, that question they associate the Sage's first seminar with uh, an English course. And in fact, uh, if you get credit for an English course through AP or IB or even transfer credit, um, that's okay. You can still use that course uh, to count towards any arts and humanities general education requirements uh, for your degree, but it does not replace the first seminar. The first seminar, the university seminars, all the stages requirements, those are courses that are unique to Case Western Reserve University, and those are experiences that we want every student to have. So your, your AP English credit will still work for you, it just doesn't replace your first seminar requirement. Great, thanks. I have another question regarding Sage's first seminars. We have several students who are looking at their schedule in SIS and they see that there is an FSCC course on their schedule. Why is it there and do they have to keep that course there? Can they change the time slot? Or what's going on with that? That's another really good question. So uh, your SAGE's first seminar, as Dean Hamill mentioned already, is something that uh, you'll be you know, you'll be scheduling after you complete the registration on uh, July 12th through the 17th. Uh, the reason that we have the first seminar time block on your schedule right now is because every first seminar has what's called a fourth hour. And fourth hour is gonna be in addition to your regular uh, Sage's First Seminar meeting time. So when you actually go to choose your Sage's First Seminar in early August, you'll have a range of different times and days to choose from when you're indicating the ones that you're interested in taking. And so some of them may meet, you know, Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and in the morning and the afternoon. Um, but regardless of when your regular uh, meeting time is for your Sage's First Seminar course, once a week, either on Monday or Wednesday, it won't be both Monday and Wednesday, it'll be either or, um, from 12.30 to 1.45, you'll have what's called fourth hour. And fourth hour is a time for you and the other students in your first seminar course to engage in a variety of different activities. So it could be that you're going to one of the museums in University Circle, or you're um, going to hear a lecture on a certain topic, or you're doing some kind of you know interesting activity, um, viewing a, a film in your class or something like that. But your Sage's first seminar instructor will decide how to use that time, but again, it'll either be a Monday or a Wednesday, it won't be both. Um, you'll find that out once you actually get into your first seminar course, and um, it won't even necessarily be every week. It's usually about um, two-thirds of those Mondays or Wednesdays are used for fourth-hour activities. Great, thanks. I have another question here from Devin, and Devin has taken the online Spanish diagnostic and tested into a 300 level Spanish class. However, when he went to choose a class, the one he's interested in is Spanish 311, and it has a prerequisite that says I have to take Spanish 202. Does that prerequisite apply, or can Devin take this course with his uh, score on the Spanish diagnostic test? 
That's a good question. I think we're getting a lot of uh, questions regarding foreign languages um, with the placement test. If people have the AP credit or IB credit or transfer credit for the um, for, to get into a 300 level class, they should register. They should be able to register without a problem. But we are working um, with the registrar's office to get uh, anyone who has placed into or has placed high enough on the placement test to get into a 300 level class to give them permission um, to register for classes. Um, if that does not work, it should. Um, then he can email us or go onto the the um, change form that that Michael had mentioned, saying that you know I'm trying to get into this course. But that he should be able to register um, next or not next week. I guess it's been saying next week for a while. I guess he should be registering <laughs> the next couple of days um, into the 300 level Spanish course that he wants to get into. Thanks. I have another question here from Robert. Robert would like to know how and when can an incoming first year student request a course overload? That's a good question. So um, we do allow students to uh, request course overloads, but in order to do so, um, we need the students to complete their first, sem their first semester of coursework um, and look at their uh, GPAs before making a decision about whether or not to allow that. So. Uh, our, our policy regarding course overloads is that if a student has, after at least one semester of coursework here at the university, a 3.2 uh, GPA, they may request up to 21 hours. Um, a student with a 3.5 or higher may request up to 23 hours. Uh, those courses, or, excuse me, those overloads need to be discussed with me um, directly because we need to talk a little bit more about what the intention of the overload is and kind of the uh, overall fit within the, within the schedule and the plans. Thanks. I have another question. This one comes from Jim. Jim wants to know if he enrolls in a course and finds out he doesn't like it or it's not a good fit for him, when and how can he change that course selection? Okay. Um, there are different timelines that you can change your schedule. As you know, you'll be able to register from July 12th to the 17th, um, and you can make any type of changes that you want to your schedule um, up till the end, the end of the day on the 17th. After that period of time, you won't be able to make any changes to your schedule until you actually arrive on campus um, for orientation. Once you meet with your advisor, which is the Tuesday of orientation, and you talk to them about what changes are making, then you can, you can start making changes at that particular point as well to your schedule. Um, if you're not sure that you're not going to like the class or it's not what you expect until after you get into the class, you will have um, what we call the add drop period, which is the first two weeks of classes to make any um, schedule changes at that particular point. And we hope that you can kind of figure that out in the first week because we don't want you to miss too many, you know, too much of a class. Um, but you do have that add drop period um, to look at different classes and change your schedules um, at that time. Thanks. I have a question, and I know that you mentioned this a little bit in your presentation already. But when do I meet with my advisor? It's a great question. So yes, uh, as we said before, your advisor as a first year student um, initially is going to be the instructor of your Sages First Seminar. And so you'll actually be meeting with that person on Tuesday of orientation week. You'll meet together as a group with the other students in your first seminar course. And then what'll happen is uh, after you've met together as a group on that Tuesday, uh, you also arrange for an individual, a one-on-one -on -one advising appointment with your advisor either on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday of that week as well. And that'll give you an opportunity to, again, kind of review questions that you might have about the schedule or just the university in general, and just to start to get to know each other because your, your first year advisor is gonna be someone that's gonna be a big source of support um, and play a big role in your kind of academic life here at the university. And so it's somebody you wanna get to know really well right off the bat. Thanks. I have a question coming in from Sophia, a pretty specific question. How do I delete a class from my schedule? I put one in my shopping cart by accident and I can't remove it. You should be able to remove the courses from your shopping cart. Um, if Sophia is a nurse, we have um, nursing students already registered for their classes because of the certain clinicals and so forth that they have to get in. So if Sophia is a nurse, if she can email us at summerreghelp um, at case.edu, we can take care of dropping that um, for her. But there should be um, a, a function or a delete button within their shopping cart that they should be able to drop a course um, from their shopping cart without any problems. So the only caveat being, caveat being that if you're already registered for that course, um, like I said, because of your nurse, uh, we're going to have to do that for you. You're not going to be able to withdraw from a course. Thanks. I have another question that's come in, and this one is about math. 
uh, I have been invited to take Math 227 instead of 223. After two weeks of taking 227, and I want to switch to 223, is it possible I won't be able to do that because 223 will be full? That's a good question. Um, you know, it, it will really depend on the situation. So to answer the question generally, yes, if you are starting out the semester in 227 um, and for some reason you find that it's not the right fit for you, that you would prefer to be in Math 223, you're certainly able to do that you know, within the drop ad period, so by the end of the second week of the semester. Um, if there's a situation where, let's say, you know, all the sections of Math 223 are um, that would fit within your schedule and, and without any kind of drastic uh, rearrangement of your schedule are full, you know, come talk to us in undergraduate studies and we'll work with you on an individual basis to find a solution. Great, thanks. I have another question. Um, I'm sorry about that. I got confused for a second there. I have another question. Um, if I have AP scores that give me credit for Math 121 and Math 122, do I need to take Calc 3 or does it depend on my major? That really does depend on what your major is. Um, there, if your major does not require any calculus or doesn't require or only requires a year of calculus or a year of math, then you don't need to take any more math courses at that particular time. If you are in an engineering program or in certain BS programs, you do need to take beyond uh, calculus one and calculus two and take three and four. So if you're a history major, if you're a, a BA in chemistry major, you don't need to take more math if you don't want to. If you do like math, by all means, you know, take more math if you want, but um, the AP will satisfy those requirements, and it's only if your major requires it that you should take um, Calculus 3. And, one and a follow-up to that question. that question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. sorry about that. A follow-up to that question. If I'm planning to go to medical school and I have AP credit for those two Calc courses, do I need to take any additional math? And again, if, if it's required for your major, yes. Um, if you know, medical schools will accept the AP credit for, um, for math, so again, you don't need to take any more math if you don't want to and if it's not required um, for your major. Again, if it's something that you enjoy you taking, you can do that, but it is not required. Um, if it's not required for your major, you don't have to take any more, and med schools and uh, other professional schools will be fine with that. Thanks. I have a question from William. William wants to know, should I just plan my schedule assuming that there will be a SAGES course that fits in somewhere? I'm trying to plan my schedule so my classes are relatively evenly spread out. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to end up with a SAGES on my busiest day. That's a good question, William. So what I would suggest is, you know, for you just to go ahead and plan your schedule minus the SAGES course as you would like to have it. And what will happen is, you know, when you receive information about SAGES First Seminar um, in early August, you'll be given the opportunity, you, the only courses that you'll be uh, able to select from are ones that fit within your existing schedule at that time. And so not only will you be able to read descriptions of the courses when you go to indicate which first seminars you'd like to take, but you'd also like to, you'd also be able to see, you know, when, the, you know, the times and days that they're offered. So if there's a particular time and day slot that uh, is appealing to you or you feel like works really well, um, you know, you'd be able to indicate those as part of your selections. But in general, you know, when looking at the, the fit of the stages course into your overall schedule, um, we will do as best we can to, to help you try to find that balance if that's something you're striving for. Thanks. I have a question from James. James would like to know, can I view my major requirements on SIS? You'll, you'll eventually be able to review your major requirements on, on SIS. Um, right now, SIS doesn't know what your major is going to be. You may have an interest, but you don't have a declared major. So if you are looking for, so, and, so in, once you do declare a major, you will be able to see in excruciating detail all the, all the courses that you have to take and if you've taken those courses and what's still available, what, what's still outstanding. At this point, if you want to see what classes are required for your major, um, there's a few places that you can look. You can go to the individual um, website of the department that you're, that you're interested in, 
um, again, so whatever, whatever department that is, or you can go to the general bulletin that we have online, and that's um, bulletin.case.edu, and you can look at all of the different um, majors and minors, and it tells you, you know, what's required. There's, um, there's links to what the courses are, what the prerequisites are, um, what the electives are. So at this point, whether it's for a major or for a minor, you can look um, on the bull in the bulletin or on the department websites um, to see what the major requirements are. Thanks. I have another question from Adithi. Adithi, on her, when she initially filled out the new student checklist, indicated that she would not be transferring credit. However, she is currently taking two co college courses during the summer, and she's unsure how to try and get this credit transferred. So Did she not answer the new student checklist correctly originally, or what should she do now? Well, I think Aditi's situation is, is, is kind of unique because, you know, when we're looking for information from the new student checklist regarding evaluation of college credit, I mean, generally what we're looking at is are, are courses that you've already taken and completed while you were in high school. So this, this sounds to me like a bit of a different situation because it's post-college or post-high school graduation but pre-college matriculation. So uh, what Aditi would need to do or any other students who are in that situation would need to do would be to email summerregehelp at case.edu, um, you know, give us some more information about the courses that they're taking, where they're taking them, when they expect to complete them, and then we'll work with them individually to find out how that fits in with the rest of their overall plan for the fall semester and beyond. Th great, thanks. I have a question um, from Eric. And Eric wants to know if there are any AP scores of three that students uh, can get credit for at Case. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there are very few courses that um, you can get a three for and get credit for. Uh, most of them are foreign language courses. Um, and there's um, one math course, or the Calc BC exam, that if you get a three on the exam, but you have a subscore of at least four or five, you can get credit for um, the first semester of calculus. But other than that, it really just is some of the foreign language courses and everything else does require um, a four or a five. And again, all of the, all of the equivalencies and the scores that you, um, that you need are listed on, on the FYI guide. Oh, thanks. I have another question about AP scores. I have a student here who's, uh, emailed in that they don't know their AP scores yet, so they're not sure how to register. So I'm wondering, can they find out their AP scores on their checklist? They can, um, they can find out the scores on their checklist, or um, if they go into SIS, they'll be able to see um, what they got credit for. Um, we don't actually tell them what the score was, um, but they should be able to extrapolate whether they got credit or not, what, what score they actually had. Mm -hmm. um, so they should uh, th definitely check an SIS. Um, they can probably also call the College Board and get, if they haven't gotten a copy of their scores yet, get a copy of their scores if they want that. Um, but until we actually get scores and we know that they're, um, the scores are coming, they're going to have to register for classes as though they do not have credit for those classes at this particular point. So they should look, at the, so they should look in SIS and see what's posted. And again, if they have questions about it and they don't, or don't understand what's in there, again, email summerregehelp at case.edu and we'll help them through that. Thanks. I have another question that's come in about the math diagnostic tests. Uh, this student was placed into Math 120 and wants to know if there's any way that they can still take Calculus 1. That's a good question. So if, if you took the math diagnostic and the recommended placement was Math 120, um, what you would want to do at this point would be to go ahead and register for Math 120. And what will happen is uh, when you, during the first week of Math 120, um, you will be given another diagnostic just to kind of double check that that's the right placement for you. And so um, based on uh, that, the results of that second diagnostic, it'll either confirm that Math 120 is the right place for you to start or give you the option to, uh, to move up into Math 121 or 125 if you feel like that would be a better fit for you. Thanks. I have another question. I have a student that on their application initially indicated their academic interest is chemistry, but now they would like to major in an engineering field, potentially biomedical engineering or chemical engineering. Can I take engineering courses or do I have to remain a chemistry major? Absolutely. You can take uh, engineering courses if you want. You can take uh, really a any courses you want at this point, I mean, as long as you meet the prereqs for them, obviously. But um, that question does come up from time to time. Um, when you apply to university and you indicate a certain major of interest, 
Um, that doesn't necessarily you know, bind you to anything as far as what's available to you course-wise or major-wise in your first year because um, all first-year students, uh, with the, the exception of nursing students, will come in um, essentially undeclared. Um, so you won't have a major at this point. First-year students can actually begin declaring their majors starting November 1st. Um, so up to that point, you won't have an official major declared, and you should feel free to explore any and all academic interests that you may have. So if you decide you know, you want to go in a completely different direction than what you said when you started and you applied here as, uh, as a student, please feel free to do so. In fact, we encourage it. And if you have questions about it, let us know because we, we're definitely glad to help along the way. Thanks. I have a question that's come in from Rick. And Rick noticed that the Bio 14, Bi Biology 214 class time has changed. Is this permanent or just an error? Good question, Rick. So yes, um, we, we did change the, the time of the, the Bio 214 course. Um, so it actually you know, flipped with, uh, with chem, Chemistry 105 um, to be in, now in the afternoon. Um, so, you know, this is from, you know, with, this was done to make, actually make more room for students to accommodate um, all the student demands. So um, at this point, we should go ahead and, and assume that this will be the time moving forward that class is going to be offered. Thanks. I have another question also from Rick and from several other students. This question keeps coming in. It's again about the SAGE's fourth hour scheduled time clock. And, and Rick's question is, I noticed that the SAGE's fourth hour schedule block is Monday, Wednesday at 12.30 to 1.45. Are all the different SAGE's courses di given during this block only? Uh, yeah, and I, I apologize if I wasn't as thorough in my explanation originally on that question. Um, but yes, the, the reason that, that those times, those days and times are blocked off for all incoming first year students is because all first seminar courses, regardless of their regular meeting time outside of fourth hour, will have a fourth hour on either Monday or Wednesday from 1230 to 145. So that's the reason why we have those two days blocked off is because no first year students will be able to take courses during those times because they will have a fourth hour on one of those days at either 1230 um, or 12.30, 45 on either Monday or Wednesday. So. Thanks. I have a question that's come in from Justin. And Justin wants to enroll in courses outside of his intended major, which could count toward a potential minor. In this case, he's doing an engineering major, but a potential psychology major, minor. What should I do? Um. We like when engineers kind of step out of the engineering school and take courses in other um, other majors and minors. Um, if you're depending on what your schedule looks like this semester, I mean, you if there's a, a spot for general education requirement or arts and humanities or social sciences that's recommended for your major, um, you can make that your psychology 101 course. Or if you have AP credit for that already, you can take an upper level psychology course. Um, so things that count towards your breadth requirements in engineering can also count towards your major. So we totally encourage students to you know branch. Out, um, beyond their beyond their majors and you know take courses outside of that that specific area so I think it's great that you want to do psychology and you can totally take a class this semester if it fits into your schedule thanks we have another question that's come in about courses that require permission and one student has asked for permission to join a course and wants to know how will they be notified and when will they be notified if they're going to be able to get into that course that's a good question. So, um, you know, we had asked the students to uh, submit uh, requests for courses that required consent um, by the 8th. And uh, actually, I am working through those myself uh, currently. So you will hear from me uh, no later than tomorrow as far as, you know, kind of what the status of that request is. So I, I'm committed to uh, letting you know um, before registration opens on the uh, 12th what the status of that request is so thanks I have a question that's come in from Tommy regarding chemistry Tommy's planning to go into computer science or some other engineering field has AP credit and could skip chem 11 and take engineering 145 but is wondering if he should take organic chemistry or engineering 145 
For someone going into engineering, I, I, we'd really recommend taking the Engineering 145, keeping your AP credit um, for 105, 106, and 113. And going into Engineering 145, is that's a, um, an engineering core course, and it's required by all the engineering um, departments. And um, for organic chemistry, depending on what um, major you're going into, may or may not be required. Um, so we would recommend that you take Engineering 145 now and then taking OCHEM um, later on in your career. Thanks. I have another AP question. And this student wants to know, if I have AP credit, do I have to do something, check a box, or fill out a form to formally accept that credit? And if I don't want the credit, is there something I have to do to say that I don't want that AP credit? So as long, once you send the scores to us, and as long as they you know, meet the requirements to earn credit, um, that credit will get applied to your record automatically. So there's nothing more that you need to do than to just send the scores to us, and we kind of take care of the rest. Um, if, if you're talking about not wanting the credit in terms of you'd like to repeat the course and not use that credit, um, then what you do is just simply enroll yourself in that same course that you've already got credit for. And then once you complete that course, that uh, course that taken in that credit um, earned for that course taken here at the university will override that AP credit. Thanks. I have a question that's come in from Slater. And Slater wants to know, as, there, as he's choosing his courses, is he choosing courses only for the fall semester, or are these courses for the spring semester also? A question that we've gotten a few times. Um, it is only for the fall semester, so you'll be selecting classes for this semester, you know, seeing how those go, and then you'll be able to, you know, work with your advisor or um, with department reps um, um, at the end of the fall semester, choose classes for the spring semester. But right now, um, there are only one semester courses um, that you're that you're selecting. Thanks. Um, I have another question about AP credit that's come in, specifically about biology. What is biology T200 and what does it count for? Um, biology uh, 200 TR is um, it's biology credit. Um, it do, it's not a, a direct equivalency to any case course. Um, so we give you general um, college level credit for it, but it's not, it's not equivalent to a specific course. Um, it can, um, if you do have that credit, you can use it to fulfill certain requirements. You can fulfill um, the science, uh, natural science requirement and your general education requirements if you need to do that. Um, but if you're going to be a biology major, um, that will not count towards your biology major, um, but it will count for, like I said, general overall um, hours towards degree requirements as well. Thanks. I have a question from Firas. Firas has placed into a 300 level Spanish course via the online placement test. And he wants to know if he enrolls in that 300 level Spanish class, does he earn credits for the previous Spanish classes, say Spanish 201 and 202 and, and all of those courses? That's a good question. So, you know, when you're thinking about um, the, the placement test, the placement test is really just designed to tell you what would be the appropriate level for you to start your study at. So if you, you know, place into 300 level through the, the placement test, um, it doesn't give you any credit for any previous coursework. The, the only way you'd have credit for a previous coursework uh, here at the university would be either through AP or IP, IB exams or um, through college level credit that you took um, while you were in high school. But the placement just tells you where is the best place for you to start to kind of maximize your, your prior knowledge of the language. Thanks. Uh, we have a question that's come in, and a student wants to know, is it possible to be on a wait list for a class? The, there's not a, a wait list function for courses. So um, actually, what's, what's replacing the wait list function and what's kind of serving the same purpose is that schedule change request form. So you think of a wait list for you know, being requesting a space in a course where the course is full. And that schedule change request is serving that same function. So if you find yourself in a situation where you want to get into a course, but it's, it's full, um, you just go to the schedule change request under the first year registration item on the new student checklist, um, enter your personal information, contact information, information about the course you want to get into, and then we'll follow up on the rest from there. Thanks. I have a different sort of question that's come in. 
Uh, we have a student who has some information, knows some of the professors or knows about some of the professors at Case and is looking to take some classes from some specific people and has been looking on the schedule of classes in SIS, seeing what professors are assigned to courses and wants to know is that final or were those professor assignments for those courses change? I'm pretty sure the, the classes, the, the instructors are pretty final um, mm -hmm. for, for this semester in case, you know, something catastrophic happens. Hopefully that doesn't. Um, but they're pretty much set for, uh, for this semester. The, the faculty know in advance what classes they're going to be teaching. So if he can't find the faculty or faculty members that he's looking for, they might not be teaching anything this semester or on sabbatical. Um, but it's, it's pretty solid that those are the, um, the instructors that will be teaching the courses this semester. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Eric about minors, and Eric is is curious about when he should start choosing courses for minors, and where can he find information on what's required for a minor? Again, um, if uh, looking for courses that are required for majors or minors, um, you can either go to the website of the um, of the department in which the minor is offered. Uh, is one place to look. You can also look in the, in the general bulletin, um, which is online. Again, that's bulletin.case.edu. Um, and you really don't need to start taking classes um, for your minor at this particular point. Um, some things may um, fall in naturally on, on some of the courses that you're taking. For example, if you're looking to do, um, if you're an engineer and you're doing, um, you, know, you have to take a math course and you're looking to do, you know, a, a minor that works, you know, that has math in it, then it can count towards both. But right now, we, your first semester, we just want you to kind of get on campus, you know, start taking some classes, work on that major, and then you can work on doing your minor later on because most of them are only um, five courses so you'll have plenty of time to look at minor um, requirements later on. Great. I have a question from Ann Rand about the uh, SAGES schedule and it's really a two-parter so let me see if I can paraphrase here. Ann Rand wants to know that once he's assigned to his SAGES seminar course can he change it and can he change out of the Monday or Wednesday section so that his SAGES classes will meet on Tuesday and Thursday? Um, again, kind of going back to the the question before about how you know how do you select the first seminar and how do you get it to fit within you know your schedule to make it work. Um, like I said, you know when you go to indicate you know the first seminars, it, it's okay to go and, and look through and see which you know days and times they fit in, um, and, and kind of maybe prioritize some of those. But what we hope more than anything else um, that you're considering when you're thinking about your first seminar course is, you know, what's the content of that course? What's the course all about? Is it something that speaks to you? Is it something that appeals to you? Is it something that excites you? And hopefully, even if those courses maybe aren't the ideal uh, courses for your schedule, that'll be enough enticement for you to want to be in that course and to indicate that those are the courses you'd like to be in for your Sage's first seminar. Now, if there's a situation where you find yourself in a course that just really, really doesn't work for you, um, and that means you've, you know, you've gone and met with your first seminar advisor during orientation week, and, and you find out more about the class, and you see how it all lines up, and it just really doesn't work, um, you come talk to us on that Friday of orientation week. There'll be a special, um, a special time period for you to come meet with the director of SAGES if that's becoming a problem for you. But in most cases, like I said, you know, we're working around your existing schedule trying to help you find some balance, um, but we hope that, above all, that you know, it's the content of the SAGES course itself that really drives your desire to be in a particular course, not you know, the days and times that it's offered. Thanks. I have a question on a different topic. We have a question from Joe who wants to know, is there any advantage to taking the enhanced physics or enhanced math class, which he's been invited to do, rather than the standard math and physics classes? Well, I guess to answer that, I mean, I would think about what the what the phrase or what the term advantage means, um, because really it comes down to kind of a personal decision. I mean, you know that there's nothing you know wrong. There's no disadvantage to taking the the regular offering. So you know, taking Math 223 instead of Math 227 doesn't put a student at a disadvantage. Just like taking Physics 121 instead of 123 wouldn't either. You're still going to get really great learning experiences no matter which course you take. I think what it really comes down to is you know how do you want to approach that subject? Do you want to you know approach things from more of a theoretical perspective? Do you want to go really more in depth? Do you really, really love that subject? 
And if that's something that you know you find appeals to you, then it may be to your advantage to take that course because that's something that will bring you the most fulfillment. But in terms of advantage, as far as you know, looking great on a transcript or you know putting you in a better position as far as you know thinking ahead to graduate schools or things like that, um, that's not what they're designed for, and that's not really what they do. Thanks. We have a question from a student planning to go to medical school, curious about the decision to decide between a BS or a BA in biology, chemistry, or biochemistry, and is any of is the BS better for those in terms of preparation for medical school? We do get that um, asked a lot by people um, looking to go to um, medical school or dental school, and the question is, the the, the answer is really there is it, it's really up to you. Whatever you just need to choose whatever um, major you think you're going to be doing that you'll be able to do the best in that you're passionate about. Because school is going to be looking at what your performance is, uh, what your performance was here. Um, there's no you know benefit to a BA or BS. Um, there's different requirements that you need to think about. Um, so doing it for BS just because you think it's better is not a reason to do it. If you're looking for a BA in chemistry or biology, uh, or BS rather, um, the things that differentiates it from the BA is really um, there's some more quantitative um, classes that you need to take. So you'll need to take additional, usually additional um, calculus and physics courses. And the BS will require you to do um, um, research as part of your major. The BA, they have the same you know, general courses and elective courses and everything you need for the BS. It just does not require, for the most part, research, but you can still do research without having to having it required by your major. So the best advice I can give you is to you know, choose whatever major that you like, that you're going to do well in, do well in that, be passionate about it, and that's going to show through um, to the medical schools, because they would rather see someone with a BA who does really well than someone who struggles through a BS and maybe doesn't have the, you know, the, the, the grades and the experiences that they have. So whatever you think you're going to do the best in, that's the one you should go with. Great, thanks. I have a really specific question. Uh, from Jane. Jane is looking for Chinese 102 and didn't see it in the searchable schedule and is wondering is Chinese 102 going to be offered this fall? And I realize that we'll probably have to email Jane back, but thought you might know. Um, in, in most cases, when you're looking at um, language courses, if you look in the searchable schedule and you only see a, a 101 or a 201 or a 301 offered and not the 102, 202, 302, um, what you can draw from that is that um, it's, it's probably a situation where, you know, 101 is offered in, in the fall only and, and 102 would be offered in the spring only and same with 201 and 202. So if you don't see it in there, um, then that likely means that it's going to be offered in the spring. Um, so you can, you know, pick that course up in the springtime. Um, but if you have, again, you know, more specific questions about course offerings, um, and times that you don't see things in the schedule and you want to know more about, just email Summer Edge Help and you know, we'll, we'll provide you with more information about that. Okay, I have a question that's come in and actually I think we're getting close to the end. We'll probably just have one more question after this. And this student is concerned about time management and wondering if they're going to be able to do a work study job and uh, keep up with their courses this semester. <laughs> I think we'll get to the end of so who's going to yeah, answer this who's one. Answer it, so go um, I, I think that is a question that, that a lot of people have, and I, we kind of addressed it a little bit at the beginning. Um, you know, it, it's really going to be individual specific. Um, you know, if you're really struggling with time management at this point, you probably want to you know, see if you can find, you know, work on some skills over the summer. Um, when you come to campus, we do have um, different offices. Um, the Educational um, Support Services Office can help you with time management. But it's really going to be you know, how it fits into your classes, how disciplined you are. Um, we do have people who work um, and take classes, who are in you know, lots of different extracurricular activities. But you know, it'd really probably be a good thing to you know, work on some of those skills this summer and you know, see how you're able to balance everything and, and you know, stay disciplined and on track. Because um, it really will be you know, how dedicated you are to that. Because it's going to be a very different lifestyle that you're going to have here, you know, being on campus. And as we talked a little bit about earlier in the session, you know, having maybe more free time and balancing that between, oh, I, I've got some free time, so let me go off and you know, play video games or hang out with friends or go jogging versus you know, um, spending time on classes and doing assignments and, and working in study groups. So it is possible to have you know, work study jobs. It's work, it is possible to do research or to play on varsity athletics or being different types of um, on-campus activities. But you still just need to make sure you're managing those extracurricular things with, um, with your academics at that particular point. Um, so again, you know, maybe you start off working just a couple of hours to see how it works, and 
and then you know maybe pick up hours um, you know as the semester goes on if you're able to manage everything so it really will be an individualized decision once you get into that situation and start um, working through um, everything that you need to be in uh, that first semester yeah, and I, I would just, you know, go along with, with everything that Dean Hamill said. I think, I think she's right on. You know, I think when you look at the schedule recommendations, you know, when we say, you know, the average load is 14 to 17 hours, you know, that's kind of the range in which, you know, you should be looking to start. You know, having a work-study job is kind of nice because, you know, if you're working on campus, you can assume that, you know, the uh, your employer kind of understands that you're a student first and and can work around your schedule so definitely you you just want to ease into it you want to kind of you know start off with a little bit less on your plate and then a over time as you realize you can handle more and more and more then then maybe you can raise the, those hours up and, and and things like that but you just ease into it i think that's the way to go Thanks. I have one more question for you, and this will be our last question for the evening. This has come in from Morgan, and Morgan is interested in biomedical engineering or possibly one of the biological sciences. And Morgan would like to know if it would be helpful for her to take EBME 105 this semester and what, how that course might be helpful for her. I think so. I, I think EBME 105 um, is, is a really good overview of, of the discipline uh, for biomedical engineering. And it can really kind of give you some ideas about, you know, whether or not the major is something that you're truly interested in and you want to consider to continue to pursue further. And beyond that, you know, it gives you exposure to all the different opportunities that you're going to have within the major. Um, so, you know, it, it can give you some overview of the different, you know, specialty sequences. I think above all, hopefully what it'll do for you is just get you really excited about what you're going to be doing down the line and kind of give you that extra, you know, sense of, you know, this is my purpose, this is what I'm going to do in the major. But if not, you know, that's okay too. It can at least just give you an overview of some exposure to some different topics within the discipline and I think um, help get you, you know, on the right track to exploring majors. Right, and just to follow up with what Michael said, you'll be able to explore the different opportunities within biomedical engineering. You may find, yes, this is totally what I want to do, but if you do go to one of the other biological sciences, you'll still be able to use that credit towards overall graduation hours. So you'll have gotten, you know, the experience of, you know, finding out about all the disciplines in EBME 105 and then still count those hours um, towards graduation if you decide to be a biology major, nutrition bio, nutritional biochem major, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I guess, as Dr. Delio said, we are kind of out of time at this particular point. Um, we're going to bring up one more slide um, for you to look at. We want to review some, um, some dates um, that are up and coming that are important. You know, as you know, we've, July 12th at 9 o'clock, um, you know, registration will be opening. Uh, and you know, hopefully everyone will be able to get all of their registration issues taken care of between the 12th and the 17th. We will be having one more um, online information session. Um, Michael and I will be here again on July 19th to kind of a what's next step if people have questions about their schedule, um, they weren't able to do what they wanted, um, any more information that we have out there, we'll review at that particular time. We will be reviewing schedules from the 18th to the 27th, and you know, we have some other dates up there for you to um, review as far as orientation um, uh, dates and so forth go. The one other thing that will be important, and please check your email um, at the end of August um, from the SAGE's office so we can make sure that we get you into that, that final class for your first seminar um, and get your schedule finalized and you know, get you connected up with your advisor at that particular point. So um, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight, and hopefully we found it to be you know, um, helpful for you. Again, if you have more questions, um, you can you know, email us at summerregehelp um, at edu. Um, and also um, what we will, uh, sorry, summerregehelp at case.edu. I wouldn't get there if you just had the, without the case. Um, and just a reminder that we will be having some um, online or um, uh, phone banks um, tomorrow and uh, Wednesday from 6 to 9 p.m. and Thursday from 6 to 9 p.m. So if people still have questions about their schedule and about registering, um, the deans will be in the Office of Undergraduate Studies answering questions from 6 to 9. The number is 216-368-2928, and we'll be answering your questions there. I just want to see if Michael has anything else to say before we That's go. That's it. We uh, just hope that, you know, at this point you feel excited, you're ready to go. If you have further questions, definitely contact us. But, you know, we're here to support you along the way. It's going to be, you know, a fun, fun semester coming up. So, you know, hopefully getting registered in this process is, is enjoyable for you. We're here to help it make it easy for you. So let us know what you need. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the fall. So have a great night.